Good evening, virtual audience, and welcome. Thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Hilary Carr, and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, I'm very pleased to introduce this event with Remy Gamije presenting his debut novel, The Eternal Audience of One, joined in conversation by Maza Mengiste. Thank you all for joining us tonight. Through virtual events like this, Harvard Bookstore continues to bring authors and their work to our community and our new digital community. Every week, we'll be hosting events here on our Zoom account. As always, our event schedule also appears on our website at harvard.com events where you can sign up for our email newsletter and browse our bookshelves from home. Tonight's event is part of Harvard Bookstore's new Voices in Fiction series presented with Grub Street, highlighting debut novelists discussing their work and the writing process. This evening's discussion will also conclude with some time for your questions. If you have a question for our speakers at any time during the talk tonight, click on the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen and we'll get through as many as time allows. This event will also have closed captioning available. Depending on the version of Zoom you're using, you may need to enable captions yourself by clicking on the closed caption button on your screen. In the chat, I'll be posting a link to purchase the eternal audience of one on harvard.com, as well as a link to donate in support of this series and our store. Your purchases and financial contributions make events like tonight's possible and help ensure the future of a landmark independent bookstore. Thank you for showing up and tuning in in support of our authors and, in, and the incredible staff of booksellers at Harvard Bookstore. We sincerely appreciate your support now and always. And finally, as you may have experienced in virtual gatherings this past year, technical issues may arise. If they do, we'll do our best to resolve them quickly. And we thank you in advance for your patience and understanding. And so now I'm so pleased to introduce tonight's speakers. Remy Gamije is a Rwandan-born Namibian writer, photographer, and the founder and editor-in-chief of DOEC, Nam Namibia's first literary magazine. His writing has appeared in the Johannesburg Review of Books, Brainwaves, The Amistad, Columbia Journal, and many other outlets. His work has been nominated for numerous prizes, including the AKO Kane Prize for African Writing, the Afrotondo Short Story Prize, and the Stax Magazine Award for Best Original Fiction, and has won the Africa Regional Prize for the 2021 Commonwealth Short Story Prizes. Tonight, Remy will be joined by the award-winning writer, Maza Mengiste, author of the Booker-nominated novel, The Shadow King. These two will be discussing Remy's debut novel, The Eternal Audience of One, which Pop Sugar called one of their best books of 2021. Candace Cardi Williams, best-selling author of Queenie, said that it had her completely in its palm, a delightful, witty, and impeccably funny novel that she'll read over and over again. And the Pittsburgh book Post-Gazette called the book a timely and appropriate work of fiction that highlights the ways in which life is still heavily segmented along race, economic disparity, and a certain level of xenophobia in this part of the world, going on to say that Remy has made a bang with a slayer of a novel. It's an instant classic. We're so happy to have them both with us tonight. So without further ado, the digital podium is yours, Maza and Remy. Thank you so much, Hillary. Um, I think that that introduction to um, Remy's work gives you a sense of how excited I am about this. I have been waiting for this day for a very long time. Uh, Remy, we met, uh, we met right as this pandemic yeah, was February 2020, right towards the end of February. Absolutely, uh, yeah. I was, I was, in, I was invited into a random WhatsApp group by our friends with Kiswa Warner, and oh, you man. know, she said, "I'll put you in a group with this writers," and I thought it was just a like going to be. Shall remain secret. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I freaked out a little bit because then I remember when it said Maza Mengista has been added to the group, and I freaked out and I. Side chat is okay. So I was like, Ma who? Mas? I was like, no way. Yeah, and that's how we met. <laughs> yeah, and it has been, um, you know, it has been such a joy talking to you about writing, talking to you about films, talking to you about music. Uh, we had these extended conversations with playlists in the backdrop, which I think connects so well. And we're going to talk a little bit about, about the way your work connects to to music later, but this feels like a culmination of a number of conversations you must have been having with writers, but also with yourself and with your family. Um, I'm so proud of you. I am so excited for this. Uh, so I, I cannot wait for the world to read this book. Um, and I wanna remind everyone that as we're talking, please feel free to write your questions. Um, into the little question box and we will get to them at the end of this session. Um, but Remy, thinking about um, the last few years for you, which have been 
really busy. You were co-founded yeah. the Literary Journal, um, which I'd love to hear more about. You were shortlisted for a number of short story awards. Uh, you're releasing your debut, and quiet as it's kept, you give salsa lessons, which I have been dying <laughs> to to take, but you won't do them online for me. Um, and I am wondering, what is it like to to wear all of these different hats? To do all of this work, um, how do you manage it? Um, with a with a little patience and love and support from my friends. Uh, no, it's it's wonderful. I love all the things that I do, uh, and as stressful as they seem or might sound, um, I think the end point of everything is always rewarding because they are all personal choices that I've made in my in my life. So with writing, it is very very rewarding because. Um, it's been a long life, lifelong ambition of mine to, to be a writer, to be an author. I didn't always know how it would happen or when it would happen, but since a young age, since discovering the magic of books and storytelling, I've always enjoyed them and I wanted to be a part of that world in some way. My first entry point was as a reader and that's just the best kind of citizenship to have, to be a reader. Um, everything else with you know, with running the salsa studio, that was something I came to after I left advertising because I was not happy in that world. Um, I was telling stories, but not the kind of stories I wanted to tell. Um, I didn't want to sell loans anymore. Uh, if that's to be honest, I remember the day I resigned, I was like, I don't want to be selling loans or credit cards anymore. Um, or, and, and using using the magic of storytelling to sell these things that I didn't believe in. That was, that was like a big personal and emotional hurdle for me to overcome. And that's where the Salsa Studio started. Um, and I do that because it's pure passion. It is not like writing. It is not like storytelling in any way. It is trying to get into your best physical and authentic self in some way. And I enjoy that. But I enjoy that a lot because it creates community. And community is a very hard thing to find here in Vintec and to make and to hold on to. So I enjoy that work a lot as well. It's been sad because we haven't been able to dance since 2020. So we are all itching and raring to get back into it. But you know, with the current conditions, we're biding our time. Um, everything else with Duke, with the Literary Magazine, that is the work. Um, that And that is what I do on a daily basis, trying to curate Namibian voices not only for us but also for the world outside and you know trying to find opportunities for writers from here the things that I've been able to the, the opportunities that I've had I know not a lot of people have those and so using each one to learn and then use those skills and share them with our local writing communities a very very deep passion and I think a calling in some way, and I really enjoy that work. So all of the things that I do, even though they, they take up a lot of time, I find them very rewarding at, at the end of the day, because whether it is writing, whether it is the, the salsa dancing, whether it is reading, whether it is going to the bookshop, all of it involves community work. And, I've, and I think in a lot of ways, that's what I've always been searching for. Some some place to belong, like a group of people to be a part of. And I remember the first time, you know, I still sometimes get emotional about it, but I remember my first library card. And when I felt like I was part of this community and they didn't ask about where I was from or where I was not from, all, I, all they wanted was like, how old are you? Where do you live? Here's your junior library card. And I felt like a citizen of something bigger, like part of a bigger community. And that's why I like the work that I do. It's taking part in community or building community, yeah. It's really, uh, it, I love hearing that. And I think um, that's a thread also that's going through your novel, Seraphine's search for community you know, within, uh, within Vintok, uh, in South Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm thinking now about your work in photography. You're a photographer as well. How does that connect to the, large, the larger mission that you're talking about? Um, I always knew I wanted to tell stories, but I didn't know how to tell stories. So I knew writing was 
the easiest thing to do because you were learning writing. But I remember the first time I got a camera for my birthday, I must have been 13 or 14. And it was like a small Nikon camera. And, you know, from that, from, from the very first day I got that camera, I enjoy storytelling through photography because it was different from writing. That one was about going out observing and seeing the world, trying to capture it in the way that you envision it or the way that it currently is. Mm -hmm. And that was a hard genre, or not hard genre, hard medium to get into because again, I'm not, for example, like a taught photographer, I'm self-taught. Thank God for like the internet and like free online resources, but I enjoyed that photography a lot because um, it was a different way of telling stories. And I gravitated immediately towards street photography because I always felt like that was, to me, as a young photographer, very authentic, nothing stylized, nothing set up. But it was challenging because you just like writing, it's a particular type of observation. And you need to be in the right moment and the right place and the right time. And there's like this photographer's instinct that you develop over time that you know that a moment is about to happen and you're gonna catch this woman drinking a cup of tea just at the right moment. And it's a weird creative spirit to be in. But after I discovered that I enjoyed street photography to so, so much, and I still do it. And it's been it's slowed down a couple over the past year and for a couple of years because of just personal life spaces that you're in. I'm also finding that photography is more um, it is subject to my moods, whereas writing is not, which is weird. Um, and that, it, that, that was something that I, I, I'm still really determined to do and pursue long term. So I enjoy photography as well. Um, and then I remember in Cape Town, it paid a lot of my bills. Uh, being in the fashion photography world was very lucrative at the time as a young student. Uh, put some money in your pocket when you needed to go to the club or something, you know. But I didn't enjoy that part because I realized as well, independence was a big thing for me. Mm. Um, to want to tell the story you want to tell in the way you want, not in the way that you're being told to tell it. Mm -hmm. It's I, I realized like myself, like I do not work well with those kinds of directions. And so that's why I gravitate towards street. So, and portraiture, portraiture when it's done right, it's so amazing. But you need to be in like, you as a photographer must first be vulnerable and then the subject must be willing to be vulnerable to make wonderful portraiture. And if you're not like in the right vibe or space, ooh, it can get awkward. But those, are, I absolutely love photography. Yeah. I, I love hearing you talk about that because I can see the energy of, of the photography that you're talking about transfer into the work that that you're doing and that's a whole other conversation that that we could have um yeah. but how did what was your path to writing um did you did you always want to become a writer Renmi or was this something where you decided I just have to make my own path and do this thing yeah so the first thing was I wanted to read so desperately so badly because I couldn't understand English when I moved to Namibia. And we had this thing called story hour in the second grade where you just sat on the carpet, all you little rugrats and like the teacher read to you and they'd read Roll Doll, mm -hmm. and it was in English and I couldn't understand English, but these kids were clearly laughing at something that I wasn't a part of, mm -hmm. like the BFG and Fantastic Mr. Fox and Matilda and stuff like that. And I just, I felt excluded. So I was just like, I must, we must learn English. And so, I did, and after a while, once you start enjoying the stories because you understand them and you understand the joke, from then on, it was like a power of self-defense because I went to a, I, when you're the foreign kid in a school, you need some way to defend yourself. And if you're not big, um, and if you're not fast, <laughs> and if oof, you just don't even know where the attacks are gonna come from, English becomes the best form of self-defense. So the art of storytelling, especially telling stories about other people is like one of the best defenses of a small kid. Mm -hmm. uh, and nobody messed with me or my brothers um, or my sister because we were quick with our words and we could just like diss you. And oh, it, was, it, was, it was like our way to survive as foreign kids in our primary school environment. That was like a self-defense <laughs> thing. But then later on, when you get to writing, I think it might have been about the third or fourth grade where you have these assignments that say write about your weekend. And 
when you think about it now, later on, I was like, those were unfair assignments because I would come from my lower middle class weekend and I'd write that I was at home with my dad and my mom and this is what we did. And I'd get like four or three out of 10 because Remy didn't have an imagination. And now years later, it's like, it's not that I had an imagination, I didn't have money. Like the other kids who got nine yeah. or eight out of 10 because they were doing like phenomenal things, going on trips and stuff like that. I'm like, that's not my weekend. And so, and I was like very competitive in the early years of primary school because I wanted to get like a nine out of 10. Every time you got a nine out of 10, like your dad will buy you ice cream. And then I remember the one time it was, I was like, I'm just going to lie. I'm going to lie in this thing. I'm going to say we went to the mall. We watched this movie. I didn't even know what this, whether this movie was showing at the cinema. And my essay, my Friday, my Monday morning essay right about your weekend was filled with all of these activities that I'd never done and could not afford to be a part of. And I got 10 out of 10. So I was like, oh, okay. I have, <laughs> I have never, since then I was like, so this is what storytelling is. Mm -hmm. You invent a fiction and you make it as believable as possible and you might get rewarded from it. And since then I've enjoyed writing, but the first time I really wanted to like, let me try and commit to this would be university. And it was very hard over there because ooh, writing is not the type of thing you wanna tell your, you, wanna, you don't wanna tell your East African dad that you mm -hmm. wanna do that. Um, especially when they've sent you to be an engineer and they've paid fees up front. Ooh, it's not stuff some that you want to do. Uh, but I really always, since 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 the early grades, since high school, all the time I've participated in English Olympiads. I participated in the high school, the common the the high school equivalent of the Commonwealth essay. Um, I always enjoyed those kinds of things because you read and you wrote and you're part of a community of like young writers and stuff like that. And then in university was when I really wanted to write, but I didn't know the path, I, I didn't know any writers. So it was just a, a, a way of like figuring things out by accident. And that's how I came to writing. One of my friends, Bongani Kona, got nominated for the shortlisted for the Kane Prize. And he was a, a really wonderful, generous human being that I knew while I was at university in Cape Town. And when he, when he wrote that story, I was like, I got in touch like, yo, dude, like this is something you can do. And it was like, yeah, and we've been friends ever since. And he was like one of the early voices in the literary world that nurtured and encouraged me to write. And that's how I slowly but surely got involved. Wow, yeah. that's wonderful. I mean, that's, that's the way that community is formed mm -hmm. through mm -hmm. reaching out and reading each other's work and having yeah. those discussions. Yeah. Um, uh, it, talking about your, your struggles with learning English brings to mind the uh, the beautiful essay that just got published on LitHub today. Uh, okay. And so if maybe if Hillary can find it, uh, she can post it into chat for for the listeners. But you um, write of your listening to music, listening to the radio, listening to songs, and in that way, starting to learn yeah. the language as well. And that comes through in in your book too i mean their music is is really strong here um yeah. how would you describe or could you give us a brief introduction to okay so <laughs> beautiful beautiful novel the yeah, eternal so, audience of one yeah so the eternal audience of one follows seraphine who's a young rondon kid living in, 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 I say kid now, Jesus makes me sound so old. He's, he's like about 24 years old living in Vintook. And he's in his last year of academic studies. And obviously anyone's been through that phase of life knows the pressure that comes with what are you gonna do next? And he does, he has no idea what he's gonna do next. Although he has committed to plans that were made for him studying law at like a prestigious South African university. And it's in that last year of his life that really the book explores, but with vignettes of his parents' past and his and a, a host of other auxiliary supporting characters. So it follows him, his family from leaving Kigali in 1994 
all the way up to present day Namibia and Cape Town. Um, and it explores, it touches on like his parents' life when they were living in, in, in Europe, in Paris and in Brussels. And then it explores a lot of other character past as well, where they come from, how they wind up where they are. But really, I think it is a journey of this young person in a place he does not want to be, trying to find the place that he wants to be. And wherever he goes, there's always like some form of rejection that's that's waiting for him or some other hurdle he must jump through. And it's just this relentless, amusing, and sometimes just painful search for belonging. And it's, yeah, and that's what it's about, I think. Um, and with music playing such a big part of it, it's, whew, where would we be without music? Um, yeah, on top of reading, that's how a lot of, that's how my sister, my friends, and my brothers and I learned how to how to speak English. Like country music was a big thing on the radio, um, and we listened to this because it was slow. Um, it was slow. They spoke. You could hear the words, even though you couldn't understand the themes of heartbreak and loss or whatever. You could understand the words, and that was a big thing for us growing up, as well. Like the radio and the music that was played to, um, and my mom, for example, had that playing in the background when she was cleaning or when she was, you know, going about her chores. My dad played a lot of like old school funk as well, because this is where I found out my dad used to be in the club. Um, he used to play like a lot of old school funk. And I'm like, where did you hear this? And it was like, don't ask me questions. Um, but that's where we learned a lot of our English um, as well, from the radio and from the public library and then the classroom. But that's what the eternal audience of one really is about. This young man who's on the search for belonging in many ways, not just physical, but also romantic and also geographic belonging and belonging to a group of friends and finding a university and a calling or something to do later on in life. Yeah. The, um, the book does such a beautiful job of balancing um, moments of hilarious moments, uh, awkward moments, uh, moments with music and groups of friends just hanging out with uh, those moments that you mentioned of uh, Seraphim's family or his parents in Paris, you know, a flashback and then flashback um, to Rwanda as well. And it you balance all of these moments together and it comes together so well and, and seamlessly and makes sense as, as a whole. And I wondered as I was reading it, what the first spark of the story was for you. I mean, was it a particular scene that you thought about or was it a character? Was it music? Was it a soundtrack? Yeah. What, what was that thing? Uh, Seraphine's voice. I think I was in Cape Town when this happened. I was, I had, so this is after I just convinced my dad that I'm, I'm I don't want to do being the engineering faculty anymore. And it was like the, oh, it was like an awkward dinner conversation. But this is after I'm now at, back in Cape Town. Uh, um, um, I've now changed the humanities. Um, I've joined the student newspaper at UCT and I'm interested in writing stories because I'm working as a staff writer at this university publication and it's a wonderful exciting part and I think it's Seraphine's voice in like about 2009 that first appears and mm -hmm. it's like this cocky and weird way of seeing the world and I'd 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 always wanted to write what they call a campus novel but I didn't know what that was back then I, I that world did not exist to me but this voice kept coming to me and it had like weird ways of seeing, seeing things and describing people in such and such way. And then also like seeing the way a lot of the university friends arrange themselves into these weird cliques and hierarchies and the adventures that happened to them. So it was like this disembodiment happening where you're, you're living your life, but you're also seeing life happen around you. And I didn't know a way to capture that. And that's the first time the voice came to me and then you know rwandans being rwandans like we 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 gravitate towards like the most french and most religious names we can find and i remember my brother's name is is Ange, which means angel and i was i was always so pissed off that he got that name because Ange is such a dope name 
Uh, but I'm glad that I'm called Remy because I was going to be called Oscar and that was just, that would not have gone down well with me. Um, and so I remember like when I was writing down these character notes and whatnot, Seraphin somehow seemed to stick. I went into Google to look at common Rwanda names because I don't have enough Kenya Rwanda in my past to have that cultural aspect. And then this name stuck and it was like, it's been floating throughout in my notes since the beginning. And wow. then everything only really started coming together once I moved back to Vintuk. A lot of life had happened in and around that place. So, phase. so I had gained distance from the things that happened in life or the story that I wanted to write. I could look at it from a distance and see, mm, maybe tweak these things here and there. A lot of books I was reading. <laughs> Where is this book? <laughs> there was this random book that was given to me in 2010 that I'd encountered in English literature. It's by, by a writer who you might know called Maza Mengist and it's called <laughs> Beneath the Lion's Gaze. <laughs> and um, that was the one of the very first books in which I'd encountered writing that was not American or that was not set in the US or the UK because, you know, hard to believe a lot of the literature that we studied when I was in university was still heavily, heavily American or heavily British which sort of like made your, your imagination stunted in the ways that you couldn't think, could a story mm. that's said in Vintook still be a story? Or mm. should I find some mm. way to move it to London? I mean, you know, like, should I set it in Camden? Because stories from Camden seem to be getting traction. Weird stuff like that. So I, my imagination was stunted in a lot of ways. Mm. And it took moving back here, reading a lot of like immigrant fiction to, to have the courage to put this particular story on paper. But the first instance of this book came in, with Seraphine in 20, in 2009. And I remember mm. the first thing I wrote down in the character sketch, which shows up in the novel as well. The first, the first line that, 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 that he says, uh, um, and it, yeah, let me find this. So it's in, it's when he's in Cape Town mm -hmm. and he's, he's talking to, he's telling the story uh, about the sauce to his friends. And there was something, it's Seraphix or Seraphire. And that was like the very first line that I wrote about this character because I love this name because you could also break it down in different ways to create mm. the little hashtags and whatnot they do. But that was like the very first thing that I, that I wrote down. And then the second was when I moved back to Vintook and I penned down, Vintook has three temperatures. <laughs> it's, like, it's just, yeah. since then I was like, this is the voice, yeah. I think this is an excellent time to ask you to please read for us. And so we can hear a bit of Seraphim's voice All and right. get an introduction to Vintuk. All right, okay. So I'm going to read the prologue. And the prologue starts off with a long forgotten essay called The Last Ticket Out of Town by Seraphim Turihamwe. Vintuk has three temperatures, hot, mosquito and fucking cold. The cities allow two or three days of mild spring weather in early September before the unrelenting heat crowds them out until May. The summers are long and sweaty, so much so the job offers can be sweetened by the promise of air conditioning and an overseeing committed to adjudicate on room temperature disputes because white people do not know how to share. Summer nights are stifling. Cooling breezes heat their curfews and leave the night air still and warm from the day's lingering heat. The departing sun brings out the mosquitoes. They are organized. They are driven. If they could be employed, they would be the city's most reliable workforce. Alas, people do not have my vision. From sunset to sunrise, they make enjoying a quiet drink on a balcony air, a buzzing and bloody affair. June, July, and August are bitter and cold. An ill wind clears out the gyms. Running noses are the only exercise anyone gets in the winter. The city is called a city because the country needs one, but really city is a big word for such a small place. But it would probably be offensive to have a capital town or a capital village. So someone called it a city. The title stuck. Life is not hard in Vintuk, but it is not easy either. The poor are either falling behind or falling pregnant. The rich refuse to send the elevator back down when they reach the top. And since cities require a sturdy foundation of tolerated inequalities, Vintuk is like many other big places in the world. It is a haven for more, but a place of less. 
if you're not politically connected or from old white money, then the best thing to be is a tourist. The city and the country fawn over tourists. The country's economy does too. That is when it's not digging itself poor. That is Vintuk. The best thing to do in the city is arrive and leave. The mistake you want to avoid is trying to make the most of it. My parents did that. I have not forgiven them for their sense of optimism. You will notice it in many people. There's a strange national pride I cannot explain, a patriotic denial of reality. Beware of that optimism. It will creep up on you. It will make you notice how in the early morning, the streets are hushed and the city's pulse is slowed down to a rhythmic, nearly non-existent thump, thump. The only people to be seen on the streets are drowsy night shift security guards, the garbage collectors hanging from the back of dumpster trucks as they do their rounds, and a few stray cats. That is when it is at its best. Vintuk has not yet prostituted itself to neon and skyscrapers, so a horizon is always a short hill climb away, and nature still squats on its outer extremities. The views are spectacular. The same optimism might lead an early riser to be up before the sun to see how the approaching light gently shakes the city awake. Alarm bells ring as children and parents prepare for school. The blue collars make their way to a bus or truck and stop and wait to be carried toward places of cheap labor. And the white collars take their time getting to desks and offices. As the day brightens, the cracked tarmac that lines the city's main artery sighs and stretches, preparing for the new day when the increasing traffic will become a viscous mess of commuters and taxis. When it is going at a full tilt, Vintuk does so at a slow hum. It pays respects to the Gregorian calendar and then some. Mondays and Tuesdays are busy. Wednesdays and, fr and Thursdays are reserved for concluding auxiliary matters. On Fridays, Everything shuts down with a firm understanding that the weekend is in session and nothing and nobody should upset the established order of things. The city has strict boredom and business hours and it keeps them. The autumn days have the high, of the high, after the high summer are the best. The sky is afire with an intense passion. It burns with bright orange and red hues which target unprepared heartstrings heart before blushing into cooler pinks that tickle the clouds. The day's fervor cools down into violent violets as evening approaches. Vintuk has good days and it has bad days, but ideally you should not be here long enough to know that. If you have made the mistake of tarrying too long in the city and forgotten to purchase the last ticket out of town, you might have to do something more challenging. Actually live here. Fantastic, Remy. Thank you for sharing that with us. I wrote down a line that you said that um, in hearing you say it, it struck me again, uh, a haven for more, a place for less. Um, and this book is full of these incredible lines. Um, this opening shows such a familiarity with Vinduk. It's such a, it's almost as if it's, uh, it's, the layers have been peeled off the city uh, and you're really looking at it. Um, and yet I, I feel a sense of affection here. Uh, maybe a love hate. Can you talk about this relationship yeah. that Seraphin has with, with the city and maybe you know talk about your own relationship with it? Yeah, nobody who stays here, I don't think. <sighs> Vintuk is like, it's smack bang in the middle of the of the country, but on the left hand side of, of it, you have like on the coast, you have this old and ancient desert, and then in the southeast you have the Kalahari, and this place is just hard and it is harsh. Um, that's the first thing that like I think anybody who lives in Namibia can admit that this place is hard in terms of geography and climate, undeniable. But in and around this harshness, there are moments that are achingly beautiful. Like you just cannot question, and it is beyond doubt that Namibia is one of the most beautiful places in the world. And it is also nice that Vintuk is not an urban metropolis with huge spread because nature isn't that far away. And we have mountains that roll through the city and you cannot question that in the high summer, like April, late April, ooh, 
like especially when you start sitting five o'clock six o'clock nobody can nobody in the world can tell me this is not a romantic place to be in also early in the morning when it's just chill, slightly chill and it's fresh and it's a new day wonderful beyond that though beyond that beauty as soon as the morning hours pass away Vintook just snaps and it changes and it becomes a different beast entirely especially if you are an immigrant because that's when you gotta get up and go about your hustle and your grind except the grind here comes with a lot of prejudice you literally wake up if you're a foreigner and you have as you step through the door you put on this second skin that prepares you to go out and deal with the xenophobia that is vintage the racism that is vintage the hardship that is vintage and nobody as well can deny that those things exist I know I got a lot of flack and for this prologue because it was just so harsh, but nobody ever questioned that it was true. The only thing that everyone ever challenged was that it's not a small place. And I was like, mm, really? Anyway, <laughs> and I remember writing about this recently when I said like, do you know how you can tell you're from a big place in the world when you can tell a joke about that place and nobody gets offended? But in Vintook, like everyone felt like they were personally picked on. And I'm like, that's how you know you're in a small place. When you personally feel like you are attacked, like Vintuk is a small place. And so those things, the reality, the harshness of this place, the beautifulness of this place does not undo the harshness of this environment. Mm -hmm. um, and that for me was a big thing in the prologue and in the rest of the story, it's like, yes, beauty, yes, savannas, yes, rhinoceros, yes, coastline, but, are we not gonna talk about the way we treat black foreigners in Namibia? Are we, are we not gonna talk about the way women are treated here? Are we not gonna talk about how restrictive this place is and how it forces you to conform to a particular kind of life? Mm -hmm. Those were the things that I was really interested in exploring. I think Seraphine experiences those in sometimes hilarious, but when you look behind the humor, you're like, that is really, really messed up. It's really, really messed up some of the things that happen to him and his family. Those instances that he goes through are things that I know that I've observed within the immigrant community here. They're so different when they're at each other's weddings or a baptism or, or even at a funeral or at a New Year's party, they're just different. But as soon as they leave their respective communities, they head out the door towards work they like become shells. They're just like, it's time to go to work, trying to go face this racism, trying to go face this xenophobia. And those were, that informs perhaps what you might call the love-hate relationship. But for mm -hmm. me, it's like the reality and the fiction. I think this beauty of Namibia is like, it's fictional, but the reality is that life here is actually downright hard. And nobody wanted to talk about that. I felt like it was something that must be discussed. Um, and I thought Seraphine was the best vehicle to explore that. My, rea my reality right now with Vintuk is different from his. Um, I think he's said it, uh, you know, our characters always said in their ways because they're always on the page. But for me, I vacillate between pure, utter crushing despondency and, you know, cloud soaring hope and optimism. <laughs> it's like it's extremes. And, uh, Every day finds you differently. It depends what, it, like, it really depends on what happened in your day that will determine your relationship to this place. For me, as I said, a lot of my life recent, my recent life revolved around my personal communities that I'd made, the dancing studio, reading and writing. These things were wonderful and they brought me a group of people who were supportive and nurturing. But COVID took all of those things away. And so now I'm just like, should have kept moving, should have not. Yeah, it's a feeling that's very hard to explain, but you feel a lot of people right now are feeling like we should have moved three years ago. Mm -hmm. Everyone's been having this conversation right now in the city. And it's interesting that I got attacked for writing this prologue about how harsh Vintuk was and the realities of life here. But just as the recession started like about two, three years ago in this country, three, four years ago in this country, like the brain drain to South Africa was like this. Everyone who could get a South African passport was fleeing and leaving this country. Like, like what's the thing? Rats on a, sh on a sinking ship. 
gone, gone, gone. And those of us who stayed were like, yeah, it's a very hard thing to explain because now I am Namibian. Um, and now I am involved in a project that is um, part of like nation building, so to speak. It's part of like the national myth-making process. I've actively chosen a role in that. And so these feelings of conflict about staying and leaving still exist, not only for me, but also for the character, but for every single Namibian. And that for me was is something that's coming to the fore. A lot of people are unhappy about life here, a lot of inequalities, a lot of injustices, and people are, are finally starting to understand what it is to be an immigrant. It's this search for better. It's this looking for a place where you can be yourself, where you can be gay and not be persecuted. You can be part of the LGBTQ community and not be persecuted, where you can make your sexual reproductive choices and not be hounded by the law, where you can have crime addressed where you can make a decent living for yourself. And that's what everyone is looking for, a decent, dignified life. This environment has robbed us of that for so long. And COVID was just like the last tip of the thing and now everybody's having this conversation personally amongst friends, whole family groups. And it's interesting to watch. And I remember one of my friends was like, dude, I reread the eternal and someone's like, I feel you, man. Like I feel Seraphin must leave Vintuk because interestingly, <laughs> Vintuk right now resembles Vintuk in 1997, thanks to COVID. Like all the new nice things that we got, like the salsa club closed, like, the library, you can't go there anymore. You can't have picnics, you can't do all of these things. So it feels like so after so long, we're like, we're back in 97 because just things are gone from the community. The social fabric of our life has changed. Uh, it makes me think about um, the way that you deal with migration in this book, the, the way that um, I think what what's so unique um, about Seraphim's story in part is this is the the moves within Africa that Africans make in search of better lives to get away from certain things and Seraphim's story highlights that uh, I think in a way that Westerners maybe a lot of Westerners don't even realize um, and this this city that that is a haven for his family. Um, for Seraphim feels like a cage, right? Mm -hmm. So he wants to go to South Africa. And um, I, when I was reading this, I think one of the most profound uh, things, and there were so many absolutely beautiful moments in here, some heartbreaking moments, but it was always that his world seems on that tipping edge of, humor and sorrow you know he's balancing this and it's it's in Vinduk and, and also uh you know South Africa in, in Cape Town um and I started wondering as I was reading this about the title Remy um the eternal audience of one and I wondered if you could talk a bit about the title I will say that we're almost out of time and we yeah, will get yeah. to everybody's questions um, I have so many things I could ask, but I'm going to do this and then mm. uh, I'm going to close with a few rapid fire questions I don't want you yeah. to think about. I just want yeah. you to answer. Okay. And then um, we'll turn it over to our audience. But could you talk about the title? Um, the Eternal Audience of One. So when I was working on this manuscript, um, I didn't know. I didn't know. I didn't know how to write it. So have you heard of that thing that says, in order to know how to write the novel, you need to write the novel. Have you heard of that wisdom? I didn't know that until I really got stuck into the writing and it was such a struggle and it was so painful. Like, and that's why I, the first draft was so long because I didn't know, I didn't know what editing was. I didn't know what structure was. So I just ripped off the whole story as best as I could. And it was like a huge, voluminous thing but in and right in and around that writing part uh i wrote this one blog post on my website about writing um 
And it was just a, it was like a manifesto for myself about what it means to write, like write for write whatever. And I think the line that I used in that blog post, that essay, if you call it now, it was, it said, you know, you need to write as sincerely as possible. And I'm like, the eternal audience of one always knows whether you're telling the truth. At the time, I thought I was writing about the writer, you know, and then when I was writing the story about Seraphin, because Seraphin is actually like multiple characters in one. Uh, if you once you start reading the novels, you realize, wait, 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 which one of them is speaking? Um, and there's this wonderful idea I was introduced to in high school. Um, with that Shakespearean thing, like all the world's the stage. And I always, I always loved that, that imagery because like, I'm like, but who's watching? Who are we performing for? And in the novel, Seraphine has this dilemma as well. And he answers and he says, you know, we perform for the eternal audience of one, but that one is not, it's not clear. And I still don't know who that one is. I don't know when you lie in a story, like who will know that you lied? Will the characters know? Will you know? Will the publisher know? It's, it's, it's a something that I'm still exploring, but that line stuck with me. And I, I didn't have a title until I reread, like at the worst part, this was when I was nearly towards the end and I'd nearly given up. And then I reread that thing and it was weird sounds, but it was like, in retrospect, it was like worse to a younger me, but it wound up being worse to a future me. And I, I really liked that line. And so I used that line and I'm thankful that it stuck with the novel and that the publishers liked it and they supported it. Because as soon as I went back, like scrolled all the way to the front of the Microsoft Word document, wrote the eternal audience of one, I was like, oh, yeah, I had that moment. Um, and it came from that essay or that piece that I'd written on my website. and. It, yeah, it was, it was weird uh, to find the title of your novel in some that you've written before. I wish there was a more firework story too. That, oh, that's I how it that. came. To I it. love that. I, I love the title. Too. And it, yeah. And it, 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 it fits Seraphim's story so Thank well. you. Thank you. Um, so before the answer is Spice Girls. Nope, you don't even know it yet. <laughs> Are you ready? <laughs> yes. Kenny Rogers or the chicks? The chicks, the chicks all day, every day, whole Gladiator discography. Or Jason Bourne. Gladiator, oh, Russell Crowe is the only man who's ever, he's one of the few men who's ever made me cry <laughs> on screen. I cried when he died. Even to this day, I still look away from the screen because I'm like. <clears throat> <clears throat> you and I, I think, have talked about this film forever. <laughs> And then we have watched yes. it so many times. And then one more, poetry or fill the blank. <laughs> poetry or cocaine. I will go with poetry one because poetry <laughs> is the best scam I've ever seen. It is a scam. I'm convinced it is con artistry at its finest. I, I haven't figured poetry. out the stuff. I know I, I, I've also written some poems, you know, I've, I, I just don't know. Ooh. And, I, and, and what I love about poets is like when it's good and when it's powerful and it hits you here. But at the same time, it looks on the paper so simple that you're looking at the poet and you're like, there has to be a scam here. Like there's no way you could write the stanza so simply, so easily, and it's so profound with 800 different interpretations. So for me, I'm like, there's, there has to be a con that I'm not figuring out. And, I'll, <laughs> and the really good poets know this about me. Like I read their works and I'm like, yo, dude, like just, and I'm looking, I'm like, I, I need to figure out how they did this. And that's one of the few art forms. And I, I, I love reading a lot about art and you know how it's made, but I still cannot figure out the magic behind poetry. I just know when it hits, you're like, yo, guys, but I can't figure out and, Sometimes poets just literally, they look like they're scamming you. And you're like, but you don't know whether it's true. I, I don't know. I, poetry <laughs> for me, because the poetry biggest scam. Ever. Yeah, yeah. Good. Not cocaine, because no. uh, cocaine's been overdone in films, but poetry. Great. 
Yeah. Thank you, Remy. All right, we have some audience questions here, and I'm going to start off uh, with the first one. We'll do three. Uh, they said they're enjoying the conversation. Uh, Lucas from Nairobi. Congratulations, Remy. Did photography influence the writing of Granddaughter of the Octopus in any way? I'm looking forward to. Yeah, did it influence the, uh, that short story yeah. um, in any way? Uh, I think photography always does because, uh, especially when you're writing characters, I, I can almost see their faces, the, the way they look when they write. And I don't have a lot of pictures of my extended family, like my, my distant Rwandan family, but there are a couple very old ones where you can, these portraits, when, when your parents studied abroad, the way they, the confident poses they struck, the, the way they looked in Paris or Belgium. And then you also have distant archival ones of like your grandparents. I always liked the way that they looked in them, like they, they didn't look scared or afraid or whatever. And so those always, the, the way people present themselves in photography often sometimes helps me write about them on paper, not specifically for the granddaughter of the octopus, but for a lot of other short stories, like the way people look, the poses, the strike. And that's why I love portraiture because portraiture, like you, you see people's vulnerabilities in, in interesting ways. And that sometimes helps to color in what a character looks like or what they say and how they look when they say it. Yeah. That's beautiful. Thank you, Lucas. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. And the next one is uh, anonymous. He said, this is great. Thank you. What is your writing process? Do you outline or jump right in? Do you write a bit every day or in big chunks? Uh, my writing process is panic. Uh, it is panic, pure panic. Uh, realizing that you never have enough time to write every single thing that you want uh, because the realities of our lives as writers is that, you know, they're still very precarious, more precarious now than they might have been in the past. And so it's the panic, waking up panicking and realizing I might not have enough time to write this thing. But first I need to attend to the responsibilities of my life. I can't write when I know there's like another deadline that pays or when there's a bill over my head. So dealing with the responsibilities of life is first. Um, and then cleaning, this is weird, but I clean <laughs> before I write. Uh, yeah, I, 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 I clean. And so it's in that cleaning moment, it's sort of like meditative and you're arranging things in your head and you're solving plot points and you're just figuring out the language of something. Cleaning is very meditative for me. That's also how my wife knows that I actually haven't written anything because if she comes home and it's not clean, she's like, what have you been doing? Uh, <laughs> and then the writing part itself, it always helps me because um, I'm not taught uh, in the sense that I'm not a taught writer. I never went to any writing school. I do the things that I did when I was in high school. I find those things so helpful, like a bullet point of like the major events that happen in the story, arrange them in a way that makes sense. Uh, I start writing in longhand because it's again, very therapeutic or meditative and then I just have a very good handwriting so I like that part of the and I like writing the physical act of writing once that's written obviously you need to transpose it onto a computer and that's when the hardest thing is like the editing that's that when you start rethinking phrases and you now trying to get to the sentence level when you're when you've read the shadow king and your whole world has been split into a million pieces because you're like, I am never going to write anything good ever again. And you now have to start rearranging things in your story because you're like, damn, Fifi though. Yeah, <laughs> and that's that part of the writing is wonderful because that's when you're re-examining your work, questioning your work. And I find that part of the work more challenging than the part of the story, uh, than, the, than the drafting phase. Um, and then once that's been done, um, Finding the courage, another hard thing, finding the courage to either send it or share it with a friend for reading and consideration or sending it for publication, hoping that it survives the submission pool. And I cannot lie to you to this very day, that last part remains the hardest. Yeah, it, it really even doesn't matter what it is, even, even something as simple as an email. I really do think about these things before I write. And I'm like, yo, do I want to send this? Up? That last part, finding the courage to 
send work out is remains the hardest and most challenging. Yeah. Thank you. I'm gonna uh, put a, a few of the questions together. Um, mm. One of them is, uh, if you had to write your next novel in any genre except what you typically write in, what would you choose? So what's your dream genre? Part two of the question is, um, what do you do if you can't come up with an ending of a story? And has this ever happened to you? And then uh, someone, uh, Gloria Wanika wants to know, um, when you did your first draft, what was the revision, like the writing process? Did the story change a lot? So dream genre, what do you do if you can't come up with an ending? Has that ever happened to you? And what was the rewriting process like? Uh, I'll start with the rewriting process. The first, Maza, get this, the first draft, like honest to God, two hands on the Bible, was like 272,000 words. Who, what kind of moron writes that? Like, I, I, I look back on, on, on this and I'm like, where did I find the time and the energy? But I, I realized I didn't know what I was doing. Like, and that's, that's fine. Like, I just, I didn't know. I was figuring it out as I went. The rewriting process really happened when Tabiso Maklape, who's the publisher of Blackbird Books, by some miracle managed to slog through this first draft and said, I love it, we'll take it on. You need to cut it in half. I was just like, mm -hmm. oh Lord. No, I, I was like, oh. but after she said that, and she gave me pointers, things like uh, say something once and then don't come back to it again unless you have something new. Repetition, basically. That was, I went through this manuscript and I saw, pa -pa 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 -pa, change this, cut this out, leave this out, whatever. And then I managed to cut a third out by myself, just from those very well directed pieces of advice. And then the revision with, with, with Scout Press was wonderful. Again, working with very, very, very uh, high caliber editors and writers who give you pieces of advice, who nitpick every small detail. And I learned so much through this. Like I'll never look at like pop, not pop culture references. Yeah, pop culture references ever again, because sometimes in your head, some a piece of pop culture, you think it happened when you experienced it, but it's actually older and you're talking about it like it happened now. And that, that was wonderful to experience. Not much of the story has been changed since revision. The voice still remains the same. And I think that's when I know personally when I'm onto something, when even with revision, the voice stays the same, like a little, the plot can move to the left or a little, but the voice is true. And that's what I like. Uh, if I don't know an ending, I, I do my best not to start something. Um, why I don't like that feeling of frustration that comes with not completing a project. It's a big thing for me as well. I love completing tasks. It's my personality type, I guess. And so when things are in limbo, or they're hanging, I absolutely despise that. So when I'm thinking of a plot, I have to envision it, how it might end, even if I don't know how it starts, but if I can know the ending, this is how it ends, then you, I can figure out everything else along the way. Cause that feeling of frustration of not completing something, yo, it grates at me. Um, my dream genre, I would say I've already written my dream genre. I, 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 I always wanted to write the story and I did, but I will say, the genre I would like to have a crack at, an honest crack at, would be historical fiction. But hey, like no. historical fiction, <laughs> no, word, word, I love it. word. I think you should. Word. Um, the reason why I say that is because there's such an abundance of rich stories in, like from history, but I know within myself, I'm not sure whether I'm in the space to commit to the research that it takes to do such a project, uh, but also maybe the maturity that comes with dealing with historical stories. Uh, and then thirdly, the duration that it takes to produce a wonderful work of historical fiction. Because when you've read Hilary Mantel and her, her Wolf Hall series, 
or you've read the shadow queen <clears throat> cough cough you don't want to like just wade into this thing and just be like hey this story happened in 18 foot like no 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 you gotta approach these things methodically well thought out and stuff like that um the only genre i know that i definitely would not or that i i steer away from as much as possible is spec fic because i still don't know what that is speculative fiction i've seen it and i read it and i enjoy it but when i get to writing i don't know when does the werewolf come in that's I, I don't know <laughs> oh, i love that i would say that uh i would read any historical fiction written by you Remy, because i think <laughs> that you would do something uniquely yourself in it and so it, if I'm going to, I might start nagging you about this once we're off of this thing. Um, yeah. But I, What's I your dream that. genre? What's your dream genre? Or have you written you already? You know what? I was, I actually thought, okay, that historical fiction. And then I want to get, we have, we, we have to close, but I don't. Yeah. Do we not want to write another gladiator, Remy? Yes. I, I mean. <laughs> All right. I mean, you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh lord like i'm hoping hoping against hope that i'm able to put out a a collection of short stories and stuff like that because uh you know when we talk about gladiator the epicness of those to the audience we talk about it a lot yeah yeah the epicness <laughs> of those private. lines and the scenes and the way that they happen you're just like who would not want to write something like this Oh gosh, Maza, you must write. You, you've got to write like well, the Gladiator sequel for us because, oh you gosh, you and I, you and I, <laughs> talk about that. Yeah. Um, so I have a, a, a Cecile Berensma said thank you for yeah. the great conversation, Maza and Remy. Love hearing you talk about your novel and work process. Always learning something new. I hear you about cleaning. Um, yeah, can I can I can I interrupt you, Maza? Yeah. Cecile is my wonderful agent who found me from a random short story that was published in American Code Data. And she sent me a DM on Instagram and said, oh. I read this short story. Do you have a manuscript I can look at? And it was like a month after this had been published in Essay. And so she's a wonderful, supportive oh, woman who's been part of my career. Call, and thank you, Cecile. Thank you, Cecile. <laughs> so she, so she's she's been the person pushing this left, right, and center. Uh, we've wonderful. been through the trenches. Yeah. That's <laughs> wonderful. Um, Remy, we have to close this yeah. out. It has been such a pleasure. Uh, thank you to all the audience members. Please tell your friends. Please grab a copy. Um, this is truly a, a beautiful book uh, by a writer who's, who's going to be here for a very long time. Oh, look at that. <laughs> I didn't even pay you. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you, Hillary. Thank you, Maza. Thank you so much, everyone, for making the time to be with us. Uh, I appreciate it. Please look after yourselves and your loved ones. Thank you both. This was so lovely. Thanks to everyone who joined us. Uh, for spending your afternoon or evening or morning with us. Uh, you can learn more about this book and purchase it on harvard.com. And on behalf of Harvard Bookstore here in Cambridge, Massachusetts, have a good day, keep reading, and everybody please stay well. Thank you Thank both. You. Wear your Thank, mask, you. Everyone. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye.